This is tape number two in our righteousness series. On our first tape, I covered what righteousness was. We basically defined it. The layman's definition that I'm working off of is that righteousness is basically just right standing with God. And we discussed two types of righteousness. There's what I call self-righteousness. The spiritual term would be uh, righteousness, which comes by the law, or work righteousness. And then there is a righteousness that comes by faith, and that's God's righteousness. And it's imputed unto us. It's not earned. It's something that, as we believe in the Lord, it's just given unto us. And so I used a lot of scriptures on the last page. We dealt with uh, Romans chapter 9 and, and uh, just many different places, Philippians, uh, Galatians, different places. And if you can believe what the Scripture says, then you would have to say after that previous teaching that the Bible teaches that we are made righteous, not by our own effort, but it's really just by believing in the Lord that we are created righteous in the sight of God. And so uh, that was true. But you know what? Most people still have trouble receiving righteousness because they look in the mirror and the Bible says that we are now the righteousness of God in Him. That as Jesus is righteous, we are just that righteous. And people look in the mirror and they can't understand this. And they say, this doesn't make sense. How in the world can I be righteous? They see all the faults and problems that they have in the flesh. They search their soulless realm and they see their attitudes and things and they know that there's unrighteousness in it. And they just have a, such a hard time with what the Word says versus what they see in their own personal life. And what I want to do on this page is to explain that to you and show you how that even though we act the way that we do and with our problems that we have, how can we be righteous? Let me just start off by saying, giving a testimony that uh, about 1972, it might have been 71, I guess, and I got back from Vietnam. Uh, I had been uh, exposed to a little bit of teaching on righteousness. I'd had this experience with the Lord that I mentioned previously in 1968 where God just showed me His love. And I intuitively knew that God loved me independent of what I deserved. And it changed my life, but there was a real turmoil in my life because I'd been taught all of my life that I was ungodly, that I was unrighteous, and that I had to be better for God to really love me, accept me, and move in my life. Now, I had an experience that told me differently, but all of my doctors told me that that's the way that it was. So there was a conflict. And I had gained some understanding. I'd begin to hear a few things about righteousness. There'd probably be a few glimpses that God had given me about that I was righteous. But still, the teaching that I had taught me that there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. And on and on the scriptures go about that. And that's basically where my head was, even though my heart had been really touched by the Lord. And when I got out of Vietnam, a friend of mine had been traveling with Tim Copeland. And he got to preach to me that we've been made righteous. That we're pleasing to God, not based on anything that we do, but based on what Jesus did for us. And I basically had uh, just shelved all these things he was saying because to me it didn't harmonize with the pictures that I knew, and I just thought this guy was misinformed. But he taught me into going to a Bible study. See, this was really interesting because uh, about 1971, I went to this Bible study. I was still in the Baptist church. And I was offended before I even got started because it was run by a woman. There was a woman in the Bible study, which according to my Baptist doctor, the woman couldn't shoot a man in the first place. So I was offended from the very beginning. And then when I got in there, there was nothing but hippies in there, long-haired hippies. And in the Baptist church that I was in, it was pretty strict. And if a man had hair that touched his collar, I mean, he went directly to hell. He did not pass go. He could not be saved. You couldn't have any relationship with God acting that way and talking that way. So anyway, here I was in this Bible study run by a woman with a bunch of hippies there. And I was trying to be gracious unto them and not say anything. But then they got to talking about being righteous. Now, my friend saying that he was righteous, I just figured he was misinformed. And when I saw these other people claiming to be righteous and speaking about how that, man, they were clean and pure in the sight of God, and I just couldn't handle it. I mean, I stood up in that Bible study. I read them the right act. I quoted my three scriptures to them. Isaiah 64, 6, that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Romans chapter 3, I believe, verse 10 or 11, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
Romans 3, 23, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And man, I just put them in their place and told them that they were all sinners and that they ought to repent, and I sat down. And you know, to my surprise, these people, instead of being angry at me and responding back the way I expected them to, they operated in love towards me. I mean, I felt so much love from these people, and they shared 10 scriptures for every one that I found it blew me away. I didn't know that there was scriptures in the Bible like that. About being right. And see, this is basically what we did on our first tape. I shared all of these scriptures that said that it's not our righteousness, that if righteousness comes out of the law, Christ is dead in vain. You can make Christ of none effect in Galatians chapter 4. I saw those things. They were sharing these type of scriptures. And uh, it just infuriated me. So what I did, as I looked at Bible study, I went out and bought a Young's Analytical Report. I looked up 540 references in the Bible that use the word righteous, righteousness, righteousness is. I studied all of those. I wrote them out longhand. And after a week of fasting and praying and studying the Scriptures, I was totally convinced I was the righteousness of God. I mean, I saw it. It was there. It's what the Word says. But I still couldn't embrace it. I couldn't really go out. I didn't feel good about proclaiming to anybody that I was righteous because of this exact thing that I brought up at the first of this tape. I saw it intellectually, but I still felt like, I'm, I, how can I claim to be in right standing with God? I saw my faults. My failures, I mean, my mistakes, my attitudes, and I just couldn't reconcile how a holy God could look at me and call me right. And it was because I was looking in the mirror. And what I want to share on this tape is how God explained this to me. You know, one of the truths that I've learned from the Word of God, Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, says, talking about the parable of the sower sowing the seed, it says that once the seed is sown, if the people don't understand it, Satan comes immediately and steals away the word out of their heart. I minister and see a lot of people impacted by the word of God, but if a person doesn't go on beyond just being touched by God and reach a place where they have understanding about how can this work, then God, then Satan will steal the word from them. Like in the area of healing, a person may know that it's God's will to heal. They may hear a testimony. They may be really excited. They may stand up and proclaim, I believe it's God's will for me to be healed. But then if they don't know the laws that govern faith, if they don't know how to walk in healing, how to release their faith, how to war and do things, if they don't have understanding of how it works, it doesn't do them any good to believe it's God's will to heal. If they don't know how it works. If they don't have any understanding of it, they will see it. And so it's the same thing. On our last tape, we were proclaiming that we are righteous, and we shared all of these scriptures. From, for me, it is a Bible fact that says we have been made righteous. But how can that be? And I tell you, this understanding is probably one of the greatest things that God has ever shown me. I've got a lot of teaching on this. I've got at least two tapes on spirit, soul, and body. I've got another one entitled Identity in Christ that is the third tape in a series on harnessing your emotions. I've got one entitled Complete Forgiveness. And uh, I've, got, I've mentioned this on many, many, many other things. But basically what the Lord showed me is that we are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. And it's not our body or our soul that got changed at salvation. It's not our body and soul that are righteous and in right standing with God, but it's our spirit man. And that's what really changed my life around is understanding that in the spirit I became righteous. Let me first of all, before I get into all this, let's just go back to Romans chapter 5 and look at some scriptures. This experience I told you about where I went home and I studied and I found these 540 references on the word righteousness and I studied them. Romans chapter 5 is where the Lord finally, I remember the day that this happened to me. Romans chapter 5 is where my life finally got turned around. 
I remember when I came to these passages of the scripture that I just had lost every mental argument I had against being made righteous. I mean, the word said in so many places, we've already used dozens of scriptures on the previous page about how that it's imputed unto us and that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus through Jesus being made sin for us. I'd seen it, but this just really sealed it for me. In Romans chapter 5 and in verse uh, 15, it says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. In other words, he's making a comparison, and, but he's saying it's actually an opposite comparison. The sin came into the world through one man. Righteousness came into the world through one man. So that, in that sense, it's comparable, but it produced totally opposite results. One person released death, the other person released life. In verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto me. And I'm going to go on and read some other scriptures, which five different times he says the same thing. He just repeats it in different ways. But what the Lord was showing me through this is that this says, through the offense of one, many be dead. This is talking about Adam. In the previous verse, it mentioned Adam's transgression. So this is talking about through Adam, I became dead. And see, this is a truth that I learned. It was grounded in me. Some people don't understand this. But it's not your sins that make you a sinner. You were born a sinner. The Scripture says in Isaiah chapter 50, or excuse me, Psalm chapter 51, David said, In sin did my mother conceive me. And that didn't mean that she had an illicit affair. It meant that he was conceived in sin. He had a sin nature. And that we were born that way. And uh, Romans chapter 7 says the same thing. Anyway, I don't want to teach on that. But I had accepted that truth completely, that it was what Adam did that made sin pass into the entire human race. And the Lord showed me it's just like a coin. If you're going to look at one side of this coin and accept that you became a sinner through Adam, this is saying, it's making a comparison and saying in the same way, but in the opposite direction, through one man, Jesus Christ, that gift has abounded unto me. In other words, the Lord showed me that it was what Jesus did that made me righteous in the sight of God, not what I did. The next verse says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one the condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. In other words, the one offense of Adam corrupted the entire human race. But the one sacrifice of Jesus covered... All of the sin that had ever taken place on the face of the earth. Verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. This says it's a gift. It's not something to be earned. It's not given to us proportional to our performance. It's a gift that comes from God. The thing that makes God ex excited about me and pleased with me, the thing that makes me accepted with God, is not what I've done, but it's what Jesus did for me. He gave me righteousness, right standing with God. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all man under justification of life. I don't know how anybody can get by uh, around this. Now, the offense of one, judgment came upon all men. Through Adam, we were all condemned, separated from God. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. It says that it's what Jesus did that made me righteous, and not what I did. In verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And that scripture says, I am righteous through the obedience of Jesus. You know, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, that Jesus has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That scripture says, Jesus is my righteousness. So for me to say, like Isaiah 64, 6, that all of my righteousness is his filthy rags, you know, I'd be calling Jesus a filthy rag. That's certainly not true. 
You know that scripture over in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6? If you look that up in the Hebrew, this filthy rag is actually talking about a menstrual cloth. Is what it's talking about. In the same way, you know, that you can imagine that? Man, that is how righteous you are compared to God's holy standards. Our righteousness, our self-righteousness is nothing compared to God's holiness. But when you get born again, God gives you a righteousness that is literally the righteousness of God. And you become righteous in the sight of God through what Jesus did for you, through his obedience. In verse 20, it says, Moreover, the law entered as the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace is much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Boy, that's an awesome So anyway, there's a lot more in there than what I've gotten into right here. But these scriptures, basically, just if it's like the Lord just painted me into a corner. I've been reading all of these scriptures, and I'm saying, but God, I can't understand it. And the Lord just basically said that you've accepted without question that you were born a sinner, that you were made a sinner through what Adam did, and you don't question that. You don't understand it. But you don't question it. You've accepted it, and it's inconsistent. It's actually hypocritical for me to accept that I am created a sinner by my natural birth and not accept that I'm created righteous through my spiritual birth. And I, like I said, the Lord just paid me into a corner. There's no way I could intellectually get around this. And so I just, when I read these verses, I bowed my knee and I said, Father, I don't understand it, but I believe I'm righteous. And I begin to start saying that's righteous. It's based on what God's word says. Romans chapter 3, verse 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. And I just came to that conclusion. And I said, Let God be true. And I'm going to say what God said. But then the Lord began to explain this to me. And basically, what he showed me is when you were born again, in Corinthians 5, 17, says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto God by himself. And so that verse is saying that when you get born again, you become a totally new creature. And just observation will tell you that this cannot be talking about your physical body. Your physical body didn't change. I mean, if you were fat before you got saved, you're going to be fat after you get saved. Regardless of what takes place in your heart, your body isn't instantly changed. So observation will tell you that it's not talking about your physical body being saved. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52 talks about that we have to all be changed. This mortal has to put on immortality. This corruptible has to put on incorruption. This physical body is not saved. And our mind, our emotions, our mental part of us isn't saved. Because the scriptures, you know, that show us that when you get born again, that old things pass away, all things become new. Well, you can prove by your last test score that your brain hasn't been totally renewed and that you don't know all things yet. And yet in your spirit, the scripture says that you do know all things. So if you were stupid before you got saved, you're going to be stupid after you get saved because you renew your mind. Your mind doesn't instantly change at the point of salvation. The scripture talks about that we have to renew our mind in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So it doesn't instantly happen, and yet the scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that when you are born again, old things pass away, all things become new. Not some things, but all things. Well, just by process of elimination, you can see that that's talking about your born again spirit. It's your spirit that becomes totally brand new, and that's the part of you that was made righteous. Look over in Ephesians chapter 4. This passage of Scripture is talking about being born again. And, uh, man, this is all good, but let's drop down to verse 24. It says, well, verse 23 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what we were just talking about. Your spirit's the part that's changed, but then the Christian life begins to start really impacting you as you renew your mind. Your spirit's already changed. You just get, need to get your brain in motion. And that puts two parts on you, spirit and soul, in agreement. And once that happens, the physical body, it's just a simple majority. You overrule it, and the body will experience 
whatever you renew your mind to. So you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, this terminology, new man, is used hundreds of times in the New Testament, either uh, something, either that or something similar to it. And it is speaking about this part of you that got born again. And so this is talking about the spirit part of you has been created in righteousness and through holiness. Notice that it says created. You didn't grow into this. It isn't becoming righteous and truly holy. It's talking about something that was a creative act. You can't create yourself. This is talking about an act of God. It goes back to those scriptures we used in Romans chapter 5, that through one man you are made righteous through his offspring. When a person gets born again, their spirit is a part of them that gets changed. And according to this verse, it was created in righteousness and true holiness. You know, the way that this is stated, it implies that there is a false holiness. It, spe- it specifies a type of holiness, true holiness versus false holiness. Let me just say this, and I'll explain this on our next tape in more detail. But you know what? There is a reason to maintain holiness in yourself, self-holiness or self-righteousness. When it comes To dealing with your employer, dealing with your wife, dealing with your kids, any type of relationship, you need to maintain action and you need to have holiness. But you know what? When it comes to God, that self-righteousness or self-holiness, it can never be the basis of our relationship. Because regardless of how good you are, you still are going to be infinitely short of measuring up God's standard of goodness and holiness. And so, when you are talking about a relationship with God, anything that we can produce by our own effort is actually a false holiness or an imitation. It's only a comparison of holiness compared to other people. But compared to God, there's nothing that we can do to ever make ourselves righteous in the sight of God. So this verse is saying that when you get born again, you're created in righteousness and true holiness, God's holiness. In your spirit, you have a God's literal nature. His holiness, His righteousness imputed unto you in your spirit. It's already there. It's not in the process of coming. You know, a good friend of mine, Daisy Well, tells a story about going over to Japan. And he was in a meeting, and, and he was the speaker. And so they invited him into a room to pray before the service started. And as he walked in, there were these people standing there, and they were praying. And this one guy in particular was just screaming out and saying, Oh, God, make me right. Oh, God, make me holy. And he was just crying out and pleading with God. You know, most people would go for a prayer like that. And think it's just an in a sense, it's okay if you're talking about manifesting what's already in the inside of you and just leaving it out. In other words, you want to reflect it. You want to walk in what God has already done. But you know what very few people mean is that well, when people are crying out like that, they have this impression that here we are, an old sinner, saved by grace, and we see ourselves in this completely depraved situation, and we're wanting God to just touch us and do something. And we're talking about external, physical things. Well, that's what this guy did. And anyway, Dave got up. And when he started ministering, the very first thing he said was, 
that you're as righteous as you're ever going to get. But you can't get any more righteous. You can't get any more holy. And of course, this guy got really upset, but then Dave explained it, and they had a tremendous meeting, and they saw some good things happen. You know, most people are trying to become more righteous and more holy, and that is not the Christian life. The Christian life isn't you getting better and better and better. The Christian life is recognizing that through Jesus, you've already been made perfect in your spirit. And the rest of the Christian life isn't you improving this place, but it's you getting out of the way where you quit trusting in yourself. And you let that born-again part of you that's already righteous and truly holy just begin to start living through you. See, a real mature Christian isn't a person that feels stronger and the longer they're in the Lord, they just feel like, man, I can do anything. But actually, the true attitude of a Christian is the longer you are with the Lord, you recognize more and more and more every day that man without Christ, you're nothing. That you don't think anything on your own, and you quit being self-dependent, and you start letting this born again part of you that is created in righteousness and true holiness just start living through you. You believe that God has given you things in your spirit. Like in Galatians 5.26, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. God has already placed those things in your spirit. And so when you come into a situation where you want to punch somebody's lights out, instead you just say, No, in the name of Jesus, that is not the born-again part of me. That's my own flesh. And so you say, God, forgive me. You step aside. And say, Jesus, you love this person through me. And then that spirit that already has the love of Christ on the inside of it will begin to start making Manifesting itself. Sometimes you got to prime the pump, and you may not feel a thing, but because you know it's there, you believe what God's Word says, you start acting like you love a person. You confess that you love a person. You turn around and do something good to them. You start acting in faith, even though you don't feel a thing. And, you know, if you'll do that long enough, you'll eventually find that this love of God on the inside of you starts flowing out. See, it's the same. You are created in righteousness and true holiness. Your spirit is perfect. It's complete. You don't have a spirit problem. You've got a head problem. We are thinking wrong. But in our spirit, we are already complete. And if Scripture goes along with this, this is, this is what really makes this powerful. In John chapter 4, in verse 24, the Scripture there says that those who worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The first part of that says God is the spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. God relates to you based on the spirit. God looks at your spirit, and in your spirit, He sees you, according to Ephesians 4, 24, righteous and truly holy. And that's awesome. If you can understand what I'm saying right here, this will allow you to embrace and understand and say that you're righteous without feeling like you're a hypocrite and a liar. You know, the person who says that I couldn't confess that I'm righteous because I just went out and sinned, and I did something. Well, it, it really depends on what you consider to be the real you. If you think that your physical body and your emotional, mental part of you, if you consider that to be the real you, then if you aren't perfect and if you aren't complete, if you have any wrong thoughts, wrong attitudes, wrong actions, then you're a hypocrite to say that I'm righteous if that's what you consider to be the real you. You know, I've come to my own mind and realize that there is a new me on the inside, born again part of me. And that's the real me. That's the part of me that has been born again, and it's going to live forever in the presence of God. And it never changes. It never fluctuates. And see, I've just changed my identity is what it is. When I say that I'm righteous in the sight of God, some people who are physical-oriented, and they think that only the, you know, the chemical elements that compose your body and your personality part on the inside. They think that that's all that there is to a person. 
Well, then they think that I'm a liar or a hypocrite because they can see that I'm not perfect. But see, God is a spirit. And when God looks at us, God sees us righteous and truly holy. And He looks on our spirit. And that spirit doesn't change. As a matter of fact, over in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, and the scripture there says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Now that has to be talking about your spirit. That cannot be talking about your physical body. Because your physical body isn't like Jesus. Jesus' glorified body can get from place to place. It can go in a fear in a room when the doors were locked and all the windows were shut. And Jesus could uh, just appear and disappear. We have a corruptible, mortal body that still has to be changed. We do not have a glorified body yet. So when it says, as Jesus is, so are we in this world, that cannot be talking about the physical realm. It also cannot be talking about the soulish realm, your mental, emotional part. Because Jesus, you know, that he told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that now we know in part, but then we will know all things, even as also we are known. We do not have complete understanding yet. And yet Jesus has uh, complete understanding. So that's not talking about our physical mind. It is not like Jesus yet. But in our spirit realm has to be what this is talking about. In our spirit, we are identical to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're ounce for ounce, molecule for molecule. If there are those kind of things in the spirit realm, we're identical to the Lord Jesus. As he is, so are we in this world. And notice in the last part of that verse, it didn't say, so are we going to be in heaven? It says, so are we in this world. You know, some people try to interpret this as saying, well, I act like Jesus. I'm living a holy life, and that's what this is talking about. So give me a break. Man, there is nobody that can even approach living like Jesus and claim to be perfect in intent and action the way that Jesus was. That is, that is the height of arrogance. You talk about self-righteousness. That is the epitome of self-righteousness. Anybody thinking that they are living as holy and righteous as Jesus just because they won't wear a long dress and have the hair piled up on their head and don't wear makeup. Man, <laughs> there's a lot more to holiness than those kind of things. You know, the way I look at it is that if you barn me, paint and paint it. Coach, get it to coach. I, that's just not what holiness is all about. So anyway, this is saying as he is, so are we in this world. It has to be talking about your born again spirit. Your spirit is identical to the Lord Jesus Christ. And another scripture goes along with this is over in Ephesians chapter 1. And in verse 13, that passage of Scripture says that once you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, that's important. Because, see, some people might say, well, I can accept the fact that when I got born again, that the Lord gave me a righteous, clean, pure spirit. That I was born again that way, but you don't understand. Since I've been born again, I've sinned again. I've had wrong attitudes today. And some people, even get into, you know, things that people consider to be gross sins, bad sins. All sins from God's standpoint are gross and bad. But from man's standpoint, we put different degrees of sin. And uh, some people think that you just don't understand how, how severely I fail. However righteous and holy I was created, it's now changed. It's not that way anymore. But this says that after you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. But that means this, that the Holy Spirit just encased you. I believe that this is talking about the type of seal like when a woman cans preserves. You put it in an airtight jar so that no impurities can get into it. And then you put paraffin or something over the top. And you form this barrier, a seal, so that none of the impurities, airborne impurities, can get in there and start the corruption process on whatever it is that you can. Well, that's what the Lord did with us. When you got born again, according to Ephesians 4.24, you were created in righteousness and true holiness, and then instantly you were sealed, vacuum-packed, which means that your spirit can not sin. Sin doesn't penetrate your spirit. Now put this together again with uh, John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is looking at your spirit. 
First, uh, first Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord told Samuel, he says, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You know, God deals with us based on the heart, not just the outward appearance. Man always relates to each other on the basis of what is happening on the exterior, but God looks much deeper than that. And for the born-again Christian, when God looks at us, God is a spirit, and we relate to him based on the spirit. Our spirit has been created in righteousness and true holiness. God sees us pure and holy. He isn't looking on that external part that's all defiled and that comes into the contact with all these sins and attitudes. Now, that's not to say that God ignores your natural realm and he won't show you when you're doing something wrong for the purpose of correction. But it is not the way that God relates to you. God relates to you based on who you are in the Spirit. And if you've made Jesus Christ your Lord, if you're born again, your Spirit is perfect and complete. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. Man, that is an awesome truth. And you are as righteous, as holy, as pure as Jesus is because Jesus has been made your wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. You know, if you could believe that, if you could accept what I just said right here, this would totally transform your life. It would transform your relationship with God. If you applied this to your relationship with the Lord, I guarantee you a lot of things would change. Instead of praying these prayers, like I use that example of a person saying, Oh God, make me righteous. Oh God, make me holy. Man, you don't need to be made righteous and holy. You are that already in your spirit. All you've got to do is renew your mind and begin to start letting what is already true about you in the spirit flow out into your physical life. You know, holiness should be a fruit and not a root of salvation. It ought to be a byproduct of a relationship with God. You don't get better relationship with God the holier you get. But the more you understand the relationship with God, that it is already been purchased, and it's something that is offered to you as a gift from the Lord Jesus, the more you understand that, then the more you will act holy as a byproduct, as a fruit and not a root of salvation. That's the way that it works. See, again, religion always looks on the external. Religion is always telling people, you just take care of the physical realm. You act right and you'll be right. But God is saying, no, you have to believe and receive and you get made right. And then that changes your actions. Actions are the byproduct of what has already taken place in your heart. And it's amazing how most people miss this. But if you are born again, your spirit is now righteous and truly holy. And it cannot change. Let me share another passage of Scripture with you out of 1 John chapter 3. And this is a passage that is really misused, misunderstood, interpreted by a lot of people. In 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 9 it says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Well, that's a powerful scripture. And you know, it's also a problematic scripture. This scripture says that if you are born of God, you cannot sin. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think that most people listening to me would understand that this doesn't mean it's impossible for a person to sin. That's what it looks like on the surface. But if you take it in context, even if you look at this very book over in the first chapter, John said this in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not. Verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. In verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. He's talking to Christians, and he says that if you say that you don't have any sin, you're a liar. And then he turns over in the third chapter and says that if you're born of God, you cannot commit sin. Down in the second chapter, he starts off by saying, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And he's talking about little children. He's talking about believers, Christians. These things I'm writing unto you that you sin not. Why would he have to write that you sin not if you can't sin? Because you can sin. And he says in the same verse, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So here's four verses in this very letter that talk about Christian sinning. And then he turns over in the third chapter. 
And he says, if you're born of God, you cannot commit sin. Well, the way that people have traditionally interpreted this is to say that it's talking about habitual sin. You can't habitually sin. In other words, you might sin once. If you were a drunk, an alcoholic, before you got born again, you might blow it one time, go take a drink, get drunk. You might do it two or three times. But if you just habitually sin, if you continue to sin, then you can't truly be born again. And that's what people have interpreted this verse as and how they've tried to harmonize it. I think the thing that's wrong with that interpretation is that, um, you know, alcoholism isn't the only habitual sin. We tend to put sins in the category and say that you can't continue to be an alcoholic. If you were a prostitute before you get saved, you'll change. You might make a mistake once or twice, but if you just continue to be a prostitute, you couldn't still be saved. If you were a person that was just, you know, we put these big sins on there, if you continue to do that, you can't be saved. But, you know, the Scripture lists in the same verse with uh, drunkenness, it lists gluttony over in Ephesians chapter 5. And there's a lot of Scriptures that talk about gluttony in the same verse as it does sexual immorality and drunkenness and things like this. The point that I'm making is that from God's standpoint, sin is sin. And if we habitually sin, if you're going to interpret this as habitual sin, then any habitual sin would mean you can't be born of God. And you know what? If you're overweight, which I'm overweight, I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I'm just using this as an illustration. If you're going to say that this is habitual sin, you would have to class being overweight as habitual sin, which would mean you couldn't be born of God. Now, I can just hear people saying, no, that's not what that means. Well, I agree. I'm, I'm, stating, I'm stating the absurd so that you see that this cannot be the interpretation of this verse. This verse can't be talking about habitual sin or it would also condemn everybody who overeats. Because I guarantee you, to be overweight, you have to overeat. It cannot happen one time. You can go out and eat as much food until you pass out, and I guarantee you it won't make you fat unless you do it again. You've got to do it over and over and over to be able to be overweight. It's an habitual sin. You know, the way that I believe that this verse is to be interpreted is that when it says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, it's talking about your spirit. Your spirit is the only part of you that is born of God. I've already been to that when we were over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Your soul your body have not been saved, but your spirit is a part of you that's saved. And what this is saying is your spirit can not commit sin. See, when you were born again, you were given a spirit that was created in righteousness and true holiness. There's no sin. There's no impurity in it whatsoever. And then you were immediately sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise so that no contaminant can ever get into it. When a Christian sins, the sin doesn't enter into their spirit. It stays in the physical and the soulish emotional realm. And there is a place for a Christian to repent when they recognize sin in their life because even though their spirit is still pure, and holy, they need to get that sin out of their body and out of their emotions so that Satan won't have any right or legal claim to them and to cause problems. So the way you do that is by repenting, by turning, confessing from that thing. And you take this, this holiness and righteousness that's in your spirit, and when you repent, then it flows out through your soul and through your body, and it cleanses and purges you. So, yes, a Christian can sin, and a Christian needs to repent of that sin and turn from it, not for the purpose of eternal salvation, not to get their spirit saved, but so that they can get Satan out of their mind and out of their emotions and out of their physical body. So I believe all of that. But in your spirit, that spirit cannot sin. That spirit is not the part of you that sins. The sin does not penetrate your spirit. That spirit retains its righteousness and its holiness with God, regardless of what happens in your actions. Man, if you're understanding what I'm saying, this ought to change your life. You know, there's not one out of a million Christians that really understands this. The truth is, most of us relate to God based on our physical actions, our emotional thoughts. And if we see contamination, defilement in those areas, then we just say, how could God love me? And it's not that God quits loving, it's that we quit receiving. God is always transmitting His love. We just don't have our receiver turned on because we know we don't deserve it. And we just won't let God love us. Psalm chapter 35, verse 27 says, Let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant. 
You know, God wants to magnify himself and bless all of us, but we don't let God be magnified, and it's because we don't feel worthy. Our faith is in ourselves instead of in the Savior, and we hinder God from flowing in our life because of our own feelings of unworthiness. In Hebrews chapter 10, this is a powerful passage of Scripture that will back up all of these things we've been saying about your spirit being made perfect. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, he says, For the law, and in a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very end of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offer year by year, continually make the comers guaranteed perfect. For then do they not have ceased to be offered? There's a question mark there. In other words, this is a question. If the Old Testament sacrifices could have worked, well, then wouldn't they have quit offering them? And it goes on to say, because the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience than sin. Now, the Old Testament sacrifices could not purge us, and that's what these verses are saying. But the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus can purge us, and it has purged us. And if you took this in context, if I have time to go back into Hebrews chapter 9 and read all the way through 9 and 10, you'll find out that this is the point that he's making. He's contrasting the superiority of the sacrifice of Jesus over any Old Testament sacrifice. And he says that through Jesus we have been purged, therefore we ought to receive this benefit that he's speaking of here, that we should have no more conscience of sin. Man, I can minister on this for a few hours. I'm going to have to avoid this or I'll never get down to these other verses. But I tell you, most Christians today live with a sin conscience. I was talking to a man just yesterday. I was out to lunch with him. And I was in here about 40 years old, somewhere around there. And I prayed with him a few weeks ago. He's been studying some tapes and growing in the Lord. And he told me that for the first time in his life, he wasn't convinced. That he knew that God loved him and he felt clean and pure. And yet, at really, in some sense, he's in the worst situation he's ever been in. He's failed God miserably, not a moral sin or anything like that, but I mean, he spent two years not seeking God. His life is in a mess. His body's hurting. His family's hurting. And he should be condemned in the natural way he has thought in the past. But he's not, because he's come into a revelation. He's now started seeing who he is in Christ, and this is the benefit of it. Just exactly what this verse is saying, he has no more conscience of sin. He's driving down the road, telling me, driving down the road with people in the uh, truck with him, and he just breaks out laughing with joy, and people think he's losing his mind. And I told him, I said, you are losing your mind. You're losing that old carnal mind, and you're beginning to get renewed in the things of God. And it's good. I tell you what, there is so much more to this than what most of us have seen. So he goes on to quote Old Testament scripture, shows us how that Jesus became a sacrifice for us, put his last will and testament in. To effect, and then Jesus rose to enforce his, the uh, execution of his own will. That's pretty good. And in verse 10, this is Hebrews 10, 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This says that through the death and resurrection, the will that was put into place through the death of the Lord Jesus, that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's talking about once for all times. Some people would argue with that. Some people would say, no, that's talking about that this one sacrifice is once for all people, but not for all times. You know, most people actually believe that when you get born again, you are forgiven of sins up until the time that you confess Jesus as Lord. And so your past sins are wiped out. But then every sin that you commit has to be dealt with, has to be put under the blood, and if you don't have, if you have any unconfessed sin in your life, and if you were to die, you would go to hell. Now, some people may think that's a little strange, but I've dealt with many groups that teach that exact thing. There's a man here in Colorado Springs, a pastor of a church, that teaches if you go 56 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, and if you were to have a wreck and uh, die instantly, that you would go to hell because you broke the law which God told us to honor the laws of the land. You didn't have time to confess it, so therefore you would go to hell because you had an unconfessed sin in your life. Well, most people, oh, brother, 
can't do nothing. You know what? If you believe that you have to confess every sin and have it put under the blood to be in right standing with God, well, then that would be an accurate statement. I mean, the Bible says, again, I've used this verse on the previous page, James 2.10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. And so the smallest infraction makes you defiled. It breaks the law. Now, there's a lot of people who say, I don't believe you're going to go to hell 56 miles an hour if you had a car wreck. But there's a lot of people who wouldn't believe that. But if you committed adultery and had a car wreck on the way home from committing adultery and didn't have it confessed, did you get it? Man, I can guarantee you there's a lot of you that don't believe 56 miles an hour will send you to hell, but you believe adultery will send you to hell. But the principle here is that if you have been saved through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, you've been perfected once for all. Now, again, some people think, no, that means for all people. So look at the context. The very next verse says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, See, this is talking about length of time, not for all people, but for all time. And it's contrary to him with the Old Testament priests that they had to offer sacrifices over and over and over for the same person. But this says he offered one sacrifice for sin, plural, forever. He sat down on the right hand of God. The word sat down means that he, he's not up there working anymore. He's not applying the blood anymore. He's not up there dying for us anymore. But his work is complete. He sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering, and the emphasis here is on the one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 10 says that every person who's believed on Jesus is sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And verse 14 says that if you've been sanctified, you've been perfected forever. Understand this, it's going to radically change your relationship with God. Instead of you feeling that your relationship with God fluctuates every time you sin, every time you fail in any area, well, then you're in the flesh, if that's the way you're thinking. You think that the real you is that physical, external part, the mental, emotional part. But according to the Scriptures, the real you is the spiritual part, and it doesn't fluctuate. It has been sanctified and perfected forever. Hebrews chapter 12 will verify this once again, because in verse 23, Actually, let me start reading in verse 22. It says, You are come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. This makes it very clear. It is your spirit that was made perfect. And according to Hebrews 10, 14, your spirit has been perfected forever. Sam, that's awesome. That is awesome. Do you know when you sin, your spirit doesn't receive any defilement from it. It cannot sin. It has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And no impurity penetrates your spirit. And since God is a spirit, He looks on your spirit. You have to worship Him, relate to Him in spirit and in truth. And you know, the truth is that even though you sin, that God still sees you in the spirit if you're born again, and He sees you righteous, sanctified, and perfected forever. Boy, that is awesome. Now, I'm not saying that so I can set people free to go sin. But you know what this will do? If you really get a true revelation of what I'm talking about, this won't cause you to go live in sin, but this will cause you to live holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. Because the love of Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe it's about verse 15, Paul said the love of Christ is strength. 
You know the way that you're supposed to be living the Christian life isn't out of debt, out of obligation, white knuckling it, trying to resist things, just rutting it out, you know. But no, the Christian life actually should be a revelation of, a, of the great salvation that God has given us. And it impacts you to such a degree that you are so thankful that Almighty God, holy, pure, Almighty God would grant you such great salvation and change you and make you clean and pure on the inside, sanctified, perfected forever. That should impact you so positively that the rest of the Christian life is you living holy, not in order to obtain God's love, but because you've already been extended such a great love. And the love of Christ would constrain you to live right. And you know what? Most Christians aren't doing it that way. Most Christians are trying to resist doing certain things in hope that God will accept them and love them. But the true way to do it is that the reason you resist certain things is because you know that God already loves you. And God's love is so awesome, why would you want to go anywhere else? You know, why would a person want to have a sexual relationship with a prostitute if you were in fellowship with God? Now, I could spend a lot of time developing that. Some people don't see it. They don't understand it. But I promise you that for a person to be sexually immoral, you have to be a person that's already immoral. You know, especially in our day and age, with the sexually transmitted diseases and things that are going around, it's like playing Russian roulette. It's stupid. I mean, it is stupid to the max to go out and have sex. I, I hear these things on the um, radio and they talk about don't, you know, have unprotected sex and all of these things. It's stupid. I just can't imagine people do that. It doesn't make sense. Sin isn't smart. It's emotional. And a person that goes out and lives in sin like that, it's not because it's a smart thing to do. Not only are you there to sexually transmitted diseases, but it does tremendous damage to your conscience. It hurts the other person. You run the risk of shame, scandal, a divorce, uh, you know, on and on and on and on and on. The problems go. I mean, it is stupid. It is not smart. But a person who goes out and lives like that is a person who has such a deficit on the inside. They are so empty on the inside that to them... Some prostitute is a pimp. You know what? That only that would never happen if a person was truly in a relationship with God. Now I'm not talking about you. Uh, you can be born again and have this life of God in your spirit, and yet your flesh, your soul, and your body be so estranged and so out of touch and so out of fellowship with that born again part of you, the Lord that lives in you, that yes, Christians can't go commit sexual immorality. But I promise you, they have to be out of fellowship. They cannot be enjoying that relationship with God and live that way. You can't imagine a person going in and right before they have a sexual relationship with somebody other than their mate, they go in and say, well, let's just pray and dedicate this time to the Lord. And then, Lord, we ask you to bless this. Process. You know, if you did something like that, I guarantee you, you'd jump out of bed with that other person. Because if you go to thinking about the Lord and trying to relate to Him and fellowship with Him, it would drive you from that type of a lifestyle. I hope you understand the points that I'm making See, if you, what I'm saying is that if a person understands what I'm saying about the, how God loves them and how they're righteous, it doesn't cause them to go live in sin. It'll actually cause them to live free from sin. Well, that's a powerful truth. If people could grab hold of that, I promise you, you would just see a tremendous difference in the holiness that people would give us. Look at a passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, this is Paul speaking, and in verse 20 he says, For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. And that's what we've been talking about is righteousness, right standing with God, relationship with God. So let's analyze this for a moment. When you were servants of sin, this has to be talking about before you're born again. A lost person, a person who is not saved. At that time, they were free from righteousness. They were free from right standing with God. They didn't do things that were right. Now, does this mean that it's impossible 
for them to do anything that was righteous or right in the sight of God? Certainly not. Man, there's lost people that sometimes act better than some Christians. You know, every excuse me, every lost person at some time or another has helped somebody. They've helped some little old lady across the street, or they've done some kind of goodness. This isn't saying that it's impossible for a person who is not born again to do anything right. But the point that it's making is that all of your right actions can't make you right. It can't change your nature. A person who is lost is a person who is by nature a child of the devil, and that nature doesn't change because of something they do. They have to believe on Jesus and receive the gift of righteousness. They have to be born again by faith. Your actions cannot change your sinful nature. nature. Good actions cannot change a sinful nature. And you know what? Near sex. I, I hear these things on the uh, radio, and they talk about don't, you know, have unprotected sex and all of these things. It's stupid. I just can't imagine people do that. It doesn't make sense. Sin isn't smart. It's emotional. And a person who goes out and lives in sin like that, it's not because it's a smart thing to do. Not only are they, they're the sexually transmitted diseases, but it does tremendous damage to your conscience. It hurts the other person. You run the risk of shame, scandal, a divorce, uh, you know, on and on and on and on and on. The problems go. I mean, it is stupid. It is not smart. But a person who goes out and lives like that is a person who has such a deficit on the inside. They are so empty on the inside that to them, some prostitute is a person. You know what? That only that would never happen if a person was truly in relationship with God. Now I'm not talking about you. Uh, you can be born of him and have this life of God in your spirit, and yet your flesh, your soul, and your body be so estranged and so out of touch and so out of fellowship with that born again part of you, the Lord that lives in you, that yes, Christians can go commit sexual immorality. But I can promise you that they have to be out of fellowship. They cannot be enjoying that relationship with God and live. You can't imagine a person going in, and right before they have a sexual relationship with somebody other than their mate, they go in and say, well, let's just pray and dedicate this time to the Lord. And then, Lord, we ask you to bless this promise. You know, if you did something like that, I guarantee you, you'd jump out of bed with that other person, because if you go to thinking about the Lord and trying to relate to Him and fellowship with Him, it would drive you from that type of a lifestyle. I hope you understand the points that I'm making See, if you, what I'm saying is that if a person understands what I'm saying about the, how God loves them and how they're righteous, it doesn't cause them to go live in sin. It'll actually cause them to live free from sin. Well, that's a powerful truth. If people could grab hold of that, I promise you, you would just see a tremendous difference in the holiness of people in general. Look at a passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, this is Paul speaking, and in verse 20 he says, that When you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. And that's what we've been talking about is righteousness, right standing with God, relationship with God. So let's analyze this for a moment. When you were servants of sin, this has to be talking about before you're born again, a lost person, a person who is not saved. At that time, they were free from righteousness. They were free from right standing with God. They didn't do things that were right. Now, does this mean that it's impossible for them to do anything that is righteous or right in the sight of God? Certainly not. Man, there's lost people that sometimes act better than some Christians. You know, every excuse me, every lost person at some time or another has helped somebody. They've helped some little old lady across the street, or they've done some kind of goodness. This isn't saying that it's impossible for a person who is not born again to do anything right. But the point that it's making is that all of your right actions can't make you right. It can't change your nature. A person who is lost is a person who is by nature a child of the devil, and that nature doesn't change because of something they do. They have to believe own Jesus and receive the gift of righteousness. They have to be born again by faith. Your actions cannot change your sinful nature. nature. Good actions cannot change a sinful nature. And you know what? Nearly
probably every person listening to me, I'm sure, would agree with that. Well, in the same context, just go down two verses, verse 22, Romans 6, 22, it says, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So this is in the same context. He's making the same point, but now he's switched the comparison. In verse 20, he says, when you were the servants of sin. Now he talks about being servants to God. So in verse 20, servants of sin is talking about before you're born again. Verse 22 is talking about after you're born again. And it says, you are free from sin. Now in verse 20, when it says you were free from righteousness, that didn't mean that a lost man couldn't do anything that was right, but it meant it couldn't change his nature. Your action could not change your sinful nature and make you born again. You had to receive that by faith. Verse 22 is making the opposite comparison and saying in the same way as your actions couldn't change your sinful nature and make it righteous, now that you are righteous in your nature, your actions can't change that nature and make it sinful. Man, that's an awesome thing. You know, if you're going to accept one of these truths, again, you have to accept the other. You know, it's just like in nature, there's opposites. And if you can prove one truth, well, then the other has to be true. Like, for instance, if there's an up, then there has to be a down. If there's an east, there has to be a west. You know, if all, there's a lot of things like that. And this is one of those that if you're going to accept that a sinner cannot become righteous by what he does, he can't change his nature then this same passage of Scripture is saying that a righteous man cannot become lost by what he does. You cannot change your nature. Boy, those are radical statements. And I tell you, this is stuff that has changed my life. Like I told you at the beginning of this tape, I had that experience where I saw it intellectually that I was righteous, but I couldn't understand it. And I just said, God, how could you see me righteous? Just because I was looking in the mirror, and I was seeing my flesh, and I was searching my emotions, mental part, and I was seeing my wrong attitudes and wrong thoughts. And so I couldn't believe that I was righteous until I saw that there was a part of me, the Spirit, that was created in righteousness and true holiness. That is sanctified, perfected forever. That cannot be changed by my actions. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And those actions do not contaminate. They do not penetrate that seal. They cannot reach into my spirit. And you know, when I saw this, it has given me a stability in my life that has made a huge difference. Because I still do stupid things and I still sin. And most of my sins aren't going out and you know, doing something terrible, but I fall short constantly of doing all of the things that I'd like to do, that I wish I could do, that I know I should be doing. And you know what? I used to just allow that to pile up and convince me, man, there's no way God could love me. But now I understand that God is a spirit, and God looks in my spirit. And God sees my spiritual man, and he's pleased with me, not because of my physical actions, but because of who he made me in the Spirit. My sins have been forgiven. Past, present, and even future tense sins have been dealt with. Everything's dealt with. And I know some people go to me and say, man, how could you say such a thing? Well, you better hope that God can forgive future tense sins because he died for sins nearly 2,000 years ago, and he hasn't ever died for anybody's sin since. If your sins didn't get dealt with before you committed them, then you couldn't have been saved. Yes, God can forgive future tense sins. And you know what that will do? That will set you free. Not free to sin, but free to sin. Free from the dominion of sin. You know, my sister had an experience many years ago with her oldest daughter, and uh, the oldest daughter was just real rebellious and real smart at it. And um, my sister one time was fixing supper for her husband. He was bringing home a professor from the college. 
And so my sister was in there cooking supper, and, you know, she was busy and a lot of things going on. And, and she didn't have time for a kid to be in there harassing her. My niece was in there just smarting off, and I mean, she had a real gift for getting under your skin. And uh, anyway, she smarted off something. I don't know what it was with my sister. And my sister just hauled off and decked her. I mean, hit her and knocked her flat off her back in the kitchen. And my sister is a spirit-filled Christian, has seen people raised from the dead. I mean, she knew better. My sister knew better than this, and yet she just got in the flesh and decked her daughter. And when this happened, she ran upstairs, threw herself across the bed, and she said, Oh, God, you've got to speak to me. You've got to help me, because if I ever come to my house, I'm not going to come out of here until tomorrow morning. And she said, I've got this meal to fix. I've got company coming for dinner. And she just cried out to God to help her. And you know what the Lord spoke to her? She told her, he says, Joyce, when you got born again at eight years of age, I knew you'd do this, and I've already done it, and I've already forgiven it. And you know what that did for her? Man, that just said her free. All of a sudden, she, she had thought that God, she didn't realize that was enough. But you know what God did? God not surprised when we sin. You're shocked. It's not enough. God knows exactly what we're capable of doing. And the Lord already knew. The Lord had already dealt with it. Joyce was feeling like it was a new infraction against God. And it was something that had come between them. And it had to be resolved. And until it was resolved, how could she go on? And all of a sudden, the Lord showed her that it was already resolved before she ever did it. It was resolved when she first got born again. In actuality, it was resolved when Jesus died for her sins nearly 2,000 years ago. And you know what it did? Instantly, she was able to put it behind her and go on. Now, this did not cause her to go downstairs and whoop up on her daughter and just beat up on her because, after all, she's forgiven. No, not at all. Man, she went down, and it gave her the ability to go ask her daughter to forgive her and to reconcile that situation. I'm not encouraging sin. But you know what? A person who is truly born again is not looking for an excuse to sin. If any person takes what I'm saying here, and you say, boy, this sounds wonderful. I'm just clean and pure in my spirit, so I live like the devil, and it doesn't affect my spirit, and now I've got a license to go sin. I've had people criticize me and say, boy, you're giving people a license to sin. And I tell them, I say, well, people are doing pretty good without a license. It's not me empowering people to sin. But you know what? If you really understand this, it'll cause you not to go live in sin, but it'll set you free from that sin. It'll keep that sin from having dominion over you. The Scripture says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then in verse 3 it says, And every man, this is about talking about mankind, every man or woman that has this hope in him, purifies himself, even as he is You know, if a person has ever really experienced God's love, then it says every person who's experienced God's love purifies himself, even as God is pure. That is the true heart of every born-again believer. Any person who would take what I'm saying and use it as a reason and occasion and excuse to go live in sin is a person that never was born again. Your heart's never been changed. If you're looking for a way to sin, then you've never been changed. Now, a Christian can sin. Now, a Christian can uh, actually sin a lot, depending on what they think. Religious bondage and other things can corrupt us and, and allow a Christian to go live in sin. But their heart cry, if you are truly born again, you have a heart to purify yourself. Even if you and find out how much God loves you. And finding out that God loves you even if you sin doesn't cause a true Christian to want to go live in sin, but it will cause you to live holier than you've ever lived before. And, man, this is good news. Those who, say, those who are afraid of what I'm saying and say, man, you're just taking the restraint on sin. What I'm doing is taking this fear of rejection, fear of judgment. Fear of punishing the world. And it is true that to some people that's scary because that's the only thing that's ever restrained sin in their life. And I'm convinced that love for God and appreciation for what He's done for us is actually a greater motivator than fear. Fear has torment, what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 
And most people in their relationship with God are tormented. They really are. I mean, they, they just are constantly tormented. Of, have I done enough? Am I doing something right? Am I doing everything good? Lord, have I done enough? Will you use me now? They have fear in their relationship and they're tormented. But you know what? That's not the way the Christian life is intended to be. God intended for you to serve Him out of love and to have no more conscience by sin. No more sin conscience. No more trying to earn the favor of God, but just a revelation that you've already been accepted with God. And that revelation just so overwhelms you that, man, you go out and you will reproduce what you think in your heart. If you see yourself clean and holy and pure, you will wind up being clean and holy and pure. What it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that as we behold the Lord with an open face, talking about with no veil, no law, when we don't relate to the Lord based on performance, but when we see Him with an open face, we will be changed into that same image from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that says that when you see the Lord, you'll be changed into the image that you're looking at. That same thing basically is said over in the scriptures that just used in First John chapter 3. It says that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. If a person ever sees the Lord the way he really is, you'll start being like him. If you ever understand the goodness of God, you will start being good. People who are out living in sin, Christians who are living in sin, it's because they haven't understood the grace and the mercy and the righteousness that has been given unto us. And that's the reason that sin is still dominating them. Romans chapter 6, verse 14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You can turn that verse around and say, If sin is having dominion over you, it's because you aren't under grace, you're under law. That's talking about Christians. Law will actually strengthen sin. First Corinthians 15:56 says the strength of sin is the law. So anyway, the point I'm making through all of this is that it's understanding your righteous position in Christ that actually will make the love of Christ abound on the inside of you. And the love of Christ will constrain you to live for Him. It will cause you to purify yourself even as He is pure. And you'll wind up living a holy life, but not a holy life in order to obtain God's love, but a holy life in gratitude for what God is doing. already done for you. Praise the Lord. You know, this man that I was visiting with yesterday, I told you about how he was recognizing who he was and he wasn't condemned anymore. This man was also sharing with me that it's been two weeks now since he's watched television. He says he sat down and even started to watch things. He had a routine where certain shows every night were a part of his life. But you know what? He's so excited about how much God loves him that he's not condemning anybody. The rest of his family is watching television. He's not preaching at somebody you shouldn't do. He just lost his interest. He's so excited about the Lord. He's reading the Word. God is speaking to him. And it is more exciting to him than the other things. You know, that's the way the Christian life should be. Instead of you having to take a sledgehammer and beat in the screen of your TV so that you can resist this and not watch it, you know what? need to fall so in love with God, every TV I've ever seen had an on and off knob with it. They aren't on all the time unless you turn them on. And you don't have to watch it. You know what? If you fall in love with God, you can watch TV all you want to. You'll just find out you won't want to very much. Amen. You can go sin all you want to. You just won't want to if you really are in fellowship with God. And that's the way the Christian life should be. It's not a behavior modification, but rather a change heart. Where, man, your heart is so renewed, you're aware of what God's done for you, that you're, as a person thinks in their heart, 
So are they. That's what Smith said. So let me put one last thing on this before I close this teaching, because I've been teaching about how that your spirit is righteous, it's sealed, it cannot sin, it's sanctified, perfected forever. I've been saying all of these things. And, and yet, this might leave some people wondering about, well, then, are you believing that once you're saved, you're always saved? That there is no way that you can lose your salvation. And you are about scriptures on that. I don't have time to answer this completely. I'll refer you to a tape that I have entitled Eternal Security. And if you'll get that tape, it'll go into that and answer that for you. But let me just say this that I don't believe that once you're born again, that it's just automatic, that you can sin to anything you want to. And you still retain your salvation. But on the other hand, I don't believe that your saved law, saved law, saved law, every time you sin, you have to repent and pray through and get born again again. The scripture doesn't teach such an experience. There's just one born again experience. And some people say, well, how can you believe that? If you don't believe in eternal security, then you've got to believe that you lose your salvation and you've got to pray through. No, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 6 that if you fall away, it's impossible to renew a person unto repentance, seeing they were crucified of themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. So there is no such thing as being saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, born again, again. I do believe that you can renounce your salvation, you can't send it away. You can't uh, have it taken from you because of some sin. If any sin will cause you to lose your salvation, then, I mean, if a big sin would, then any sin would cause you to lose it. it again, I refer to that scripture in James chapter 2, verse 10. If you keep the whole law and then sin in one point, you become guilty of everything. If it's true that you could sin your salvation away, well, then going 56 miles an hour would cause you to sin your salvation away. Not studying the Word, not staying in the Word day and night, not loving your mate the way that God told you to, and a multitude of things. Nobody could ever meet that standard. If I really believed that, the moment you got born again, I'd knock you in the head and kill you. I mean, I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven is just get killed the moment you got born again. It's the only way you'd keep from sending it away. The scripture teaches in verse 6, it's impossible to renew you again in the repentance. So what does this mean? Well, I believe that you can't send it away, but you can't reject it. You can't deny it. And it has to be a knowing thing. Matter of fact, uh, the Apostle Paul talked about that he was granted uh, forgiveness because he did things ignorantly in unbelief. In other words, uh, it's not just doing something. It has to be the attitude of it. And so you can renounce your salvation. You can't send it away. But you can renounce it. And let me say this, that you would never come to a place of rejecting your faith in the Lord if you don't, first of all, fall into a lifestyle of sin. Because sin hardens your heart towards God. Hebrews chapter 3 says that. In a nutshell, sin just makes you spiritually retarded. And you would have to have some spiritual re retardation to be able to renounce your faith in the Lord. Nobody in their right mind would do that. But a lifestyle of sin will harden your heart towards God. So sin could be an element in it, but you can't sin your salvation away. Your, your spirit has been sanctified and perfected forever. It's sealed with the Holy Spirit. But sin will harden your heart. It will affect your thinking. And eventually, if you continue long enough, it will lead you down a path where Satan will try and get you to renounce your salvation. Now let me put some other qualifications on this. In Hebrews chapter 6, the verses I was just quoting, it says, first of all, it says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they fall away to renew them again under the sun. In other words, this doesn't apply to everybody. It's only people that fulfill these five requirements. The first one is that you have to be enlightened. 
That's talking about that the Holy Spirit has to be the one that draws you. you know, Jesus said this, that no man can come unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. It cannot be just an intellectual pursuit, and at one time you intellectually believed in God, but the Holy Spirit has to quicken you and draw you unto God. The second thing is you have to taste of the heavenly gift, which I think that's talking about being born again, salvation. So you had to be truly born again. We're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. That's talking about a person who was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, the third, uh, fourth thing is that you have tasted, of the, or the third thing is you have tasted the good word of God. In other words, a person who's already been drawn by the Holy Spirit, born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and has actually got into revelation knowledge, where God is speaking to you through the Word. And then the last thing, you have to have tasted of the powers of the world to come, which I believe is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Basically, what these five things are doing is describing a mature person. An immature person cannot renounce their faith in the Lord. You know, when I was a little kid, I forgot how old I was, but I remember I got upset and I ran away from home. And I mean, I wasn't even a block down the street before I knew I'd been wrong. I got to thinking about where I was going to sleep, what I was going to eat. I wanted to go back, but I was too proud to humble myself. And I remember specifically getting my clothes caught in a barbed wire fence so that my brother could catch me. He was coming after me to draw me back. I mean, I thought he was never going to catch me. I had to get caught in this thing. I, I changed my mind before I got out of our yard. And yet, in the heat of the moment, I just said, I'm running away. I don't want to be a womp anymore. Did you know that the law won't back up a child doing that? Now, today they might. I mean, things are changing. Like back when I was a kid, uh, if somebody were turning me in, they would have made me go back home. Because a, a young child doesn't have the knowledge. The law doesn't hold you accountable. You could not renounce your parents and just get out of being that, a member of that family. Now, today, it's changing, but that's the way it's been historically for thousands of years. But you know what? When a child gets to be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, today I can renounce my parents. I can form a, file a legal paper. I can change my name. I can put an injunction against my mother. I can literally break all ties and have no legal responsibilities, liabilities. Basically, what it is, when you become mature, you have the ability to do some things that you couldn't do when you were immature. And that's what this verse is saying, that an immature Christian cannot renounce their faith in the Lord and become reprobate. But a person who's mature can. And I really believe that this, there's very few people that measure up to all of these standards in Scripture. Somebody might still be saying, well, brother, I did this, and yet I was saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost, operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And yet because of something, I just, uh, you know, renounced the Lord, said I wanted to go away. I fell back into sin, and uh, yet I've come back. God's accepted me. Are you saying that it was impossible for me to be saved? No, because, again, if you would look at a passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 1, it talks about people who did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And therefore, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's the term that's used in a number of places in Scripture to describe a person who has renounced their faith in the Lord, a person who is reprobate. And this describes a person who did not like to retain God in their knowledge, Therefore, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, and it describes all of these things that were going on. And uh, it says here that they are without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. So what this is describing is a person who is reprobate. You remember that scripture I used? I believe it's in John 
chapter uh, 6, verse 44, somewhere around there. It says, No man can come unto the Father except the Holy Spirit draw him. What this is describing is that when a person meets the requirements of Hebrews chapter 6, is mature enough that they renounce their faith in the Lord. If that ever happens, then God gives them over to this reprobate mind where he literally takes all conviction away from them. And they don't have any knowledge of God. See, you just can't come to the Lord when you want to. You have to be drawn by the Spirit of God. The reason I'm bringing this up is to say that if any person is saying, well, I think I may have done this, and I think I may have fulfilled these requirements, I was mature, and yet I renounced my faith in the Lord, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying that if you had any remorse, if you had any repentance, if you had any desire to be in right standing with God, then you aren't reprobate. The Holy Spirit is still dealing with you. God hasn't turned you over to a reprobate mind. So you may have thought you were mature, but for whatever reason, God has not held you accountable if you had any desire for God at all. A true reprobate person is like verse 32, Romans 1, 32 says, that you know the judgment of God, that they which do such things are worthy of death, but you don't care. You do the same and you have pleasure in them. And do it. A true reprobate person is a person that knows that they're going to hell and they don't care. They've just given up on God, and I mean, they're ready to defy God. I personally I don't believe I've ever met a person like that. I've heard some stories that I believe might conform to that, but I think that this is a very rare thing, and I can say this, that if you are listening, and if any of the things I've said causes you to you to think, oh man, am I a reprobate? Well, do you have a love for God? Do you desire to be saved? Do you desire? Are you remorseful over the things that you've done? If you are, then that's an evident token that the Holy Spirit is still, still dealing with you. And then I can say emphatically on the basis of the Scripture, no, you aren't reprobate. No, you have not renounced your faith, or it hasn't been held accountable to you. So I'm saying all of these things to say that the righteousness that you receive from God is not external, it's internal. It's your spirit. That's the part of you that is changed. And that's the part of you that is righteous, and it doesn't fluctuate. And since God is a spirit, he looks at you in the spirit, and he's pleased with you. And you know, the scripture says that for two to walk together, they have to be agreed. And if you really want to have a relationship with God where you feel his pleasure, then you're going to have to start seeing yourself the way God sees you. You're going to have to discover this new identity in your spirit. You're going to have to recognize that you're a born-again person that is sanctified and perfected forever, created in righteousness and true holiness. That as Jesus is, so are you in this world. And until you begin to see yourself that way, then you can't really walk with God because that's the way God sees you. The whole time you're belly aching and talking about how sorry you are and, oh, God, I'm such a failure, God's looking at your spirit and he's seeing you righteous. Holy and pure is workmanship. And he's proud of it. And here you are, belly aching. You're looking in the external. God's looking on the internal. And you know what? You need to, first of all, get established in your new identity, who you are in Christ. You need to embrace this, recognize that that's not going to fluctuate. And then as you begin to think that way, you'll find out that your actions will automatically begin to change. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, as a man thinks in his heart, so, or excuse me, uh, Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And the way you think in your heart is the way you're going to act. If you see yourself a loser, if you see yourself unworthy, if you see yourself as no good, no count, then ultimately you'll act that out. Regardless of how much you resist or try to go the other direction, your actions cannot consistently go contrary to your dominant thoughts. So if you would see yourself in Christ, recognize that that's who you are, then as you think in your heart, that's the way that you'd be. And you'd find out that if you saw yourself righteous, you'd begin to start acting righteous. You know, I advocate holiness. I am not against holiness. I am for holiness. Matter of fact, in our school here, we put a lot of emphasis on character and actions. But I'm just trying to emphasize that your character, your actions, help you in relationship with people. They keep the devil off of your back, but they are not the foundation, the basis of your relationship with God. 
That has to be based 100% on what Jesus has done for you and not what you do for Jesus. Man, if you ever understand this, this won't set you free from sin, it'll set you free from sin. It'll give you liberty, and it'll let you know that God still loves you. You know, regardless how bad you fail, and God changed, hadn't changed in His plans or anything for you because in your spirit, you still are as righteous and holy and pure as you ever were. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you've got to be born again to be able to have this. And it doesn't matter how good you live. It doesn't matter if you try and keep every law, every precept. I can promise you, you'll never obtain unfit. You'll never be able to keep everything. You have to just humble yourself and receive this gift of righteousness. And if you receive it as a gift, then praise God, once you receive it, God doesn't take it back. You retain that righteousness. You're sanctified, perfected forever, and you begin to start running. Nie ma znaczenia, czy próbujesz utrzymać wszystkie przykazania. Nowa rzecz, że nie będziesz nigdy w stanie 